Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns. We have just had a magnitude 6.2 earthquake strike Sandpoint, Alaska. Again, as you can see here, this is a strong aftershock following that magnitude 7.3 that occurred on July 16th. And so it looks like earthquake activity is elevated again once more in the Aleutian Islands. And what's so interesting about this earthquake sequence, the magnitude 7.3 and now this 6.2, is that the first one was accompanied by a massive magnetic pulse that changed the magnetic field strength in that area, or at least that is what the data suggests. There's a magnetic observatory right in this zone here. And now with the 6.2, we've seen a second magnetic pulse. Going to our intermagnet portal, which is a public magnetic field observatory network that stretches across the entire globe, link in the video description, we can zone in on the nearest magnetometer for this area. In fact, we have a magnetic field observatory right on top of this earthquake effectively. And this is the Schumagen Magnetic Observatory. Let's look at the data. And here we have our magnetic field data for today, the 20th of July. We set this for one day right here. We set the sample period to a second and we'll see why this is so nuts. Because if we zoom here, we see our magnetic field data. On the bottom, we have our total magnetic field strength and then we have our different components, the Z component, the Y component, the X component. Zoom over, we will see this earthquake right here reflected in the magnetic field data. This is highly anomalous. So this earthquake ruptured at 2228 universal time at a depth of 47.3 kilometers. If you look here, here's 2200 universal, there's 23. Again, it was 2228. That is smack dab on the money. And we do not see these magnetic pulses often. And in fact, this is the second one that we've seen of course, this data here is just for today, July 20th, but we set this back to let's say the 15th, all right? And we have this show all the recent days, and we will see this first magnetic pulse that occurred on the 16th quite clearly. Check this out. Massive magnetic pulse that was registered in the magnetic field right over the epicenter of that magnitude 7.3. And then you see that there was this huge shift in the horizontal component. So in the vertical component, the Z component here, we see that there was this oscillation of about 140 nanotesla. But for the Y component, it was basically 7,000 nanotesla. And for the X component, it went down about 2,300 nanotesla. So I don't know if these shifts are permanent, I thought perhaps this was some sort of equipment malfunction, but now we see this latest magnetic pulse on top of it from the 6.2, and we see corresponding shifts also in these horizontal components there. So this is more indicative of the fact that there are some massive magnetic field changes that are occurring on our planet, but they are hyper-localized in space and time. And if this is the case, this is something that has never been reported on the literature as far as I am aware. Now, one thing to keep in mind with these magnetic field observatories is that they use traditional magnetometers. And typically, if you get a magnetometer really close to something that's metal, and there's a big spike in magnetic intensity, you may need to recalibrate the sensor. So either way, we're looking at something odd here. Either Earth's magnetic field itself has shifted radically from the 7.3, and now this most recent 6.2, as you can see right here, or, and this is equally as odd, there was enough of a magnetic pulse that hit that magnetometer, causing it to decalibrate, similar to if you had leaned that magnetic sensor near, let's say, like a chain link fence, and all of a sudden the field readings went completely nuts. So either way, this is bizarre. When I used to work for Geometrics, we would get customers all the time that would send their magnetometer sensors back in to be recalibrated. So perhaps the USGS now at the station, because the earthquake ruptured directly underneath, big pulse of magnetic energy to simply need to recalibrate their magnetometer and Earth's magnetic field in fact did not undergo this thousands of nanotesla shift or this could be reading the new values for this part of the Aleutian Islands in that subduction zone on Earth. Both possibilities 
are there. We really just need to see what happens with this data over the next few days to see how it gets updated. But this magnitude 6.2 now, the latest in a sequence of earthquakes in Alaska, and this one also showing a significant magnetic pulse. Now, if there are magnetic pulses occurring in this zone here, just outside the Arctic Circle, then that begs the question of, is there something happening perhaps with the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere, which we see has been moving rapidly over the past 30, 40, 50 years? Here we have the location right there for 2001, and then it accelerated up to 54.6 kilometers per year. That's the actual last observed location in 2007. After that, we have modeled locations. It did reach a peak of near 60 kilometers per year. We see where it is right now in 2025, according to the World Magnetic Model that was released this year. And we see the projected locations of the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere, which is technically a South Magnetic Pole, a negative polarity going forward across time. That's what they expect. Here we see the remnant supervolcano called Dara from 1.1 million years ago or so, 3,000 cubic kilometers of material ejected, a massive volcanic event. This is the Gockle Ridge supervolcano. This is the slowest spreading center on the planet right here. It slows down to an absolute crawl, six millimeters per year or so at the bottom of this caldera. And there has been recent volcanism in this entire area. The magnetic field is the area on the globe where energy is funneled in from, for example, solar wind and space weather, like a solar storm impact. So this is also absolutely something to consider if you are studying the Earth and the energetic changes that she is going through. I've been your host, Stefan Burns. I will be back with more updates, but this intermediate update is quite significant in consideration of that second magnetic pulse, which is anomalous any way you cut it. Thanks so much, wishing you well, and I'll see you all in the next video. Hey everyone, as many of you are well aware of, I sell a variety of all organic herbal and coffee blends on my website at earthevolution.com store. And some of you may have noticed that there's also a variety of artwork that's now listed on the website. And this in fact is artwork that my father has painted. He's been painting with natural soil pigment now for decades, about 20 years. And in fact, my dad is now helping with mixing the teas, packing them and shipping them. So I wanted to bring him on to talk about his natural soil pigment art. Here's my dad, Lee Burns, to share more about that. Hey, hello folks, hi, hi. So uh, Stefan, thanks for the invite to your channel. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about my soil pigment art. Uh, it's a natural product. Uh, I started, um, painting uh, with uh, pigments in 06. Before that, I was an acrylic artist. And then I thought, you know, I probably can paint um, with uh, soil. You know, I uh, lived in an area with really brightly colored soils. So the first time out, I collected three pigments, did a, did a painting, thought it doesn't look too bad. Uh, I wrote a book in 2010 called Color Your World with Green Art. Color Your World with Green Art. It's available on Amazon. It goes through the techniques of extraction. It's also a motivational book. One of my inspiration individuals was Rudolf Steiner, who was the founder of uh, organic biodynamic farming and also the Waldorf schools. So it's, it's a inter pretty interesting book. It's a short book, but it at least gets you started in uh, the process of uh, natural pigment art. There are very few natural pigment artists in the United States or maybe even around the world. Uh, you know, the, the, the art goes back 40,000 years, 50,000 years of the cave paintings. Here's Stonehenge right here that we, that I painted in, I'm, I'm not sure if it was 06 or 07, but uh, I think it's a really good uh, representation. We have one here called Meteor, which uh, I think it's one of my, my best ones. It's really spectacular. This was probably painted in eight or nine, 08 or 09. And um, so, Stefan, thanks for the opportunity to show my wares and, uh, and also go to Amazon, buy the book, Color Your World of the Green Art, Lee Burns. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Yeah, and the book uh, link is in the video description. And I also just wanted to say that these paintings, these are canvas prints. So I took some really high resolution photographs of his original artwork. And then we found a really good 
artwork printer for that. So this is rolled canvas, one inch white border and uh, really high quality color reproduction on these. And the other thing that I really like is uh, the energy of the artwork. So we have, uh, for example, Vortex here. It's a very creative, kind of chaotic energy, but in uh, a way like, you know, life is a spiral. Life in the universe is a spiral itself. And then Stonehenge is fantastic because it has a really good, you could say like feng shui. It's very calming and grounding. I actually have this up behind me in my office here back home and I find it just helps to center my energy. So these are fantastic because since they're painted with natural soil pigment, they take that earth element directly into your home. And also, for example, Stonehenge will connect you to that energy of this sacred site. So you can go to earthevolution.com slash store, check out the earth artwork that is available there. And also, of course, the link to Color Your World of Green Art on Amazon is in the video description. Thanks so much.